Hey everybody, this is Laura Garcia, a realtor in Jacksonville, Florida with Berkshire Hathaway. And today I'm joined with Meredith Medvick. Um, she works for Prosperity Mortgage and she's gonna answer some questions um, that most people of my generation have about qualifying for a loan and then um, buying a house. So Meredith, can you share a little bit about your experience? Sure, sure, Laura. Uh, hi everybody out there. Um, I am Meredith Medvek and I am with Prosperity Home Mortgage. We are um, newer to Jacksonville, but um, Prosperity um, has been around for a long time. Our company is based out of Chantilly, Virginia, and we have operations in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. I had the pleasure of going there last week, um, meeting all the great people there. So that was a, that was a fun time learning more um, about um, prosperity, and um, I've been in the business since 2005. Um, the last nine years, I worked for um, a very very large bank um, to be unnamed right now, um, but I have a lot of experience um, in the industry and um, really love what I do. Um, I wouldn't be doing it as long as I have if I didn't. So um, I'm really, really excited to now work for Prosperity and be the preferred lender uh, for Berkshire Hathaway. And that's why she's here. She's yeah. gonna share some of her experience with us. Awesome. Um, so one of the questions that I get a lot is, how do you know when you're financially ready to buy a home? So yeah. what are some pointers you can give? So I would say, um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, chatted with Laura about this, you know, beforehand. And um, sometimes people ask that same question about having a baby, you yeah. know, when's the right time to have a baby? Well, I don't know that there is a right time. But one thing that I will say about, um, you know, purchasing a home, I think you want to have some longevity of living in it. I would venture to say you probably want to be there, you know, two to four years um, because, you know, you're going to be investing some of your hard-earned money, you know, in the form of a down payment and you certainly want to um, hopefully get some equity out of it, you know, when you do sell it. Um, moving is not fun either. So, yeah. you know, you certainly want to try to, you know, stay there uh, for a certain amount of time. I would generally say, at least two to four years. Okay. I think your job has a lot to do with that. So if you think that there's a potential that you could move, you know, maybe mm -hmm. in a year or two years, um, maybe renting is the best, you know, course of um, option for you right now. But um, I think you just have to kind of, you know, weigh that in your decision of whether you want to rent or you want to. Um, okay. So what when you're looking when someone's applying. What are some things that you're looking for though, like credit score or yeah. income? Like what are they gonna need to provide in order to determine that they're qualified? So when you go through a basic pre-approval process, um, we look at income, assets, employment, and credit. Mm -hmm. So from an income perspective, um, you don't necessarily um, have to have you know two years at your job. Mm -hmm. um, we have situations where people are coming right out of college and so in a situation like that, they can certainly just provide their transcript or their diploma okay. um, if they're entering into the workforce um, and, you know, if they have an offer letter or if, you know, they have their first pay stub. Okay. So you don't necessarily have to already be in the industry necessarily um, if you're coming out of um, school. Okay. Okay. Um, but if you're already, you know, in the workforce, um, obviously, you know, we're going to look at the last two years of your employment history. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with, um, you know, verifying your W-2s, your pay stubs, you know, those sorts of income documents. Okay. Um, we're going to look at your assets, which is where, you know, your down payment's coming from. Um, and then, of course, your credit. And we're going to pull your credit, and we do a tri-merge on your credit report, which is uh, three agencies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, which are the three main agencies. Mm -hmm. We're going to use the median, which is technically your middle score, but we call it the median score. Mm -hmm. So that's so we put the three score. scores together. We don't put them together. We basically take, let's say your credit scores are 700, 715, and 730. Yeah. We're using 715. Oh, okay. So, so they, you, don't, you don't do any math, it's just the middle one. Exactly, the okay. middle. Now, if you are two applicants, so let's say, Laura, you and your husband are purchasing a home. Um, if your middle credit score is 715, but your husband's is you know 640, okay. we're gonna use the 640. Oh, okay. Just a random side question here. Yes. Um, if you're, could you, while you're married, have buy a house with just one person, or do you have to 
both people on the mortgage. You do not have to have both people on the mortgage by any means, but you can't use their income if you okay. don't use, you know, so if you're using the credit, right? you've got to use the income and vice versa. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so the other question that I get a lot is a lot of people are graduating or mm -hmm. have graduated and they can't um, pay off their student loan debt. It's just following them everywhere and they feel like they cannot buy a house because of that. Mm -hmm. So what um, do you all use to determine how the student loan debt affects buying a house? Yeah, so this is an excellent question, um, especially for um, you know a lot of the clients that I know that you work with. So I'm going to read verbatim the guidelines from Fannie Mae. Um, student loans, when it pertains to student loans, if a monthly student loan payment is provided on the credit report, the lender may use that amount for qualifying purposes. If the credit report does not reflect the correct monthly payment, the lender may use the monthly payment that is on the student loan documentation, the most recent student loan statement in this okay. case, to qualify the borrower. If the credit report does not provide a monthly payment for the student loan, or if the credit report shows zero as the monthly payment, the lender must determine the qualifying monthly payment using one of the options below. Mm -hmm. So if the borrower is on an income-driven payment plan, the lender may obtain student loan documentation to verify the actual payment is zero. The lender may then qualify the borrower with a zero down with a zero payment in that case. Yep. Now, for deferred loans, which we see a lot, like if someone's still in school and they're not having to pay on the loans, um, or if it's in forbearance, the lender may calculate it the following way: a payment equal to one percent of the outstanding student loan balance even if this amount is lower than the actual fully amortizing payment or a fully amortizing payment using the documented loan repayment terms. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, they're going to use 1%. Okay. And, and what is the, the point of calculating all these payments out? Well, the, the point of it is because, especially like when you're talking about in the deferred situation, mm -hmm that debt is going to come to fruition. You're not paying it right now, but you're going to have a payment. And so um, calculating your debt to income ratio is all about, you know, your debt versus your income, seeing where you are and if you're in within the parameters. So being that, you know, this student loan is deferred and you don't technically have a payment, doesn't mean you're not going to have a payment. So they're using it for the debt to income ratio? Yes, okay. exactly. So even though it doesn't exist right now, it's going to in the course of that 30 year loan. So they so want to have to determine how, yes. it's, how it's going to affect it. Exactly. And what she just read, we're going to post in the comments yep. so that you can see it because sometimes when we're talking about numbers and yeah. math and everything, it can be a little overwhelming. Yeah. Um, verbally. Yeah, and, and that's a lot of information, so I think posting it and, and seeing it again will probably make a lot more sense, and you'll be able to understand it when it comes to your specific situation. You'll know if your student loan is deferred, if it's not deferred, if you have a payment, if you don't have a payment, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll definitely post that so you'll have access to and it. We're also going to post um, Meredith's information, so you can also always call her um, or a loan officer that maybe you're working with, um, but Meredith is a good resource. Yes. Um, and then we're going to skip the new job because yep. you talked about it. Yep, yep. Um, but another one that I get a lot, partly because of the student loan, yeah. is a lot of millennials or people of my generation um, don't have 20% down. Mm -hmm. So what can they do to still buy a house but um, not have to keep paying rent, which also is affecting them saving for the down payment? Yeah, so I mean – a lot of people don't have 20% to put down. It's not just millennials, you know. Um, it's pretty common. And sometimes it's not about having the money. It's am I going to utilize the money that I do have to put it all into putting down on a house? Mm -hmm. So there are lots of programs out there where you don't have to put 20% down. Um, there are actually, um, you know, conventional programs. And when I say conventional, that means that they're invested through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, okay? And so those programs that are available now are programs where you can put 3% down and not have even any mortgage insurance premium. So we'll talk about that in a second a little further. 
But the other types of financing that are available outside of conventional, which conventional, again, is Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac. Well, who are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are basically two entities that, um, you know, provide the, the loans uh, out there. You know, you've got Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac on the conventional side. Then you've got FHA, which is Federal Housing Administration. Okay. You've got VA, which is the veterans, of course. Um, you've got USDA, which that's another type of lending, agricultural, rural type areas. Um, so those are all the different participants, if you will, that you know are lending the money at the end of the day. And you check all the programs. They don't have to go through no. and find, okay, I want to talk to Fannie Mae. I want no, to not at all. We, as a loan officer, you know, our job is really to find the best product that's going to work for the individual. Mm -hmm. So... Um, as far as back to the program side of it, um, you know, FHA typically is and has been um, the main um, resource for first-time home buyers. And the reason why that was for a very long time is because it was the least amount of down payment. Mm -hmm. And that down payment um, is 3.5%, and that's always been the case. Now, FHA has changed their parameters as far as um, – you know, their mortgage insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about that a little bit. So on an FHA loan, there is a monthly mortgage insurance premium. Mm -hmm. And that mortgage insurance premium is called MIP. So mortgage MIP. insurance premium. Now with FHA, you have an upfront mortgage insurance premium, which is 1.75% of the loan. So it's a chunk of cash they have to pay at closing. It is a chunk of money. It is a percentage, a 1.75, that gets added into the loan. Okay, so you're paying for it over the course of the loan. You're paying for it over the course of the loan. So that gets added into the loan, the upfront. And the upfront is one time. Okay. Okay. The monthly insurance premium is for the life of the loan. Okay, so if you're doing a 30-year fixed FHA loan with 3.5% down, you're going to have that monthly mortgage insurance premium for the entire life of the loan. There is no way to get out of it. You can't get an appraisal. You can't put more money into your house to get, you know, to so that. You're paying a, a chunk, a set amount of money every single month for 30 years, no matter how much you've already paid towards the house. So you could Correct. own 90% of the house and you're still paying. That's right. Exactly. So those are some advantages and disadvantages, if you will. So FHA is a great product. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, there are certain credit, you know, situations that fit better, you know, with FHA. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you don't have as much credit profile, like the depth of your credit, like your credit history, mm -hmm. of course, your credit score, you know, sometimes. Um, but the biggest thing was the down payment. Okay, so that was really um, and has always been why a lot of first time home buyers will utilize the FHA um, program. So, do they give any money to help with the down payment? Or, no. okay, it's no. just they, they only require 3.5%? 3.5%, and FHA is um, a government entity. Okay, right. Fannie and Freddie are not technically government sponsored entities, um, FHA is. And so the government is backing that loan in case of default to the lender, okay? Um, so that's basically, you know, how FHA kind of works in a nutshell. I will give you one other piece of information when it comes to the mortgage insurance premium. Mm -hmm. For every $100,000, um, back to my example of a 30-year fix with 3.5% down, your mortgage insurance premium is roughly going to be about $70 a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it's a $200,000 loan, it's a, roughly $140, give or take a few dollars. Okay. okay, so just to kind of give you an idea when you're doing payment calculations. So it would be $70 a month for 30 years or until you pay it off. Until you pay it off, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you paid it off early, then obviously that ends. And you can pay it off you early. You can. You okay. can pay it off early. There's, no, there's not a penalty with prosperity um, okay. to pay it off early. Okay. So that, that's basically how the, the FHA piece works. Um, on the conventional side, you're asking about, you know, the um, down payment options. Mm -hmm. Now there are programs out there. Um, we have programs on the conventional side, Fannie and Freddie, where you can put 3% down. Okay. 
Um, and we have um, the product where it has a mortgage insurance premium, and then we also have it where it doesn't. When it doesn't have the mortgage insurance premium, you're looking at a higher interest rate because it's offsetting Okay. you know, the risk that is there because there's no mortgage insurance. And so you understand the mortgage insurance aspect. The mortgage insurance is to protect the lender in case of default. As an individual, we think of insurance as protecting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like car insurance. Car, car insurance. insurance, all those things. This insurance is not to protect you as the buyer. It's to protect the lender in case you don't make the payments and the loan goes into default. And we're just paying for them. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. So on the conventional side, whether you have the mortgage insurance or you don't have the mortgage insurance, it's called PMI. Okay. okay. So it's MIP on, MIP on the FHA side. And then it's PMI. P PMI on the conventional side. And the PMI on the conventional side stands for private mortgage insurance. And the reason why it's a private mortgage insurance is because there are separate entities that provide that like Geico or like it's there's companies like Radian is one of the companies that is used and so they negotiate premiums if you will that are kind of built into the conventional. But kind of like on the car insurance side, you can shop around and you can do Geico, Allstate. All the state. individuals not shopping for it, the lenders shopping for it. Like right. they have different companies that they will use to provide the mortgage insurance. Okay. And then you yeah. once they select it, you would pay. Yes. It, it works the same way as far as you're going to have a monthly payment on it. Mm -hmm. What I want to bring out that's probably the most pertinent is on FHA, like I mentioned, um, with the example I've given several times, you can't get rid of that mortgage insurance. And so is it a good option in many ways because of credit and down payment and all of these things? It is. But on the conventional side, if you can qualify, you know, if your credit meets the parameters and you have the money and, the the money and these sorts of things, on the conventional loan, if you put three or five or 10 or whatever percent down, less than 20, mm -hmm. you can get rid of that mortgage insurance. Okay. And there are a couple of ways to do that. One way is, of course, to pay your loan down to where, you know, you're at that 20%, you know, equity position. But the other way is, um, I'll give you an example. I live in St. John's County. I moved out there in 2012, and when I moved out there, I had an FHA loan initially. Well, in about two and a half years, my home increased over 20% in equity. Oh, so, so the value I, of your home increased. Yes, the value of my home increased, so I decided to basically refinance because with the FHA loan, I wouldn't be able to get rid of the mortgage insurance. So I refinanced to a conventional loan and when they did the appraisal, mm -hmm. I had 20% equity. So you no longer had to pay So I no it. longer had to pay it. Now, if you started out with a conventional loan and you put three or five or 10% down, whatever the case may be, under 20%, you could simply request from your lender to have an appraisal done. Now you'll pay for that appraisal but you can have that appraisal done, $450, $500, whatever the case may be, and once that appraisal comes back and you have that 20% equity, you can get rid of that mortgage So you're insurance. saving about $70 a month to do that? Yes. Over the course of 30 yes. years? Which right. Can add up. So yeah, so you can see you know, $70 a month, if you pay $500 for an appraisal, it doesn't take very long to have a break even there and get your money, money back. So that was the main distinction that I wanted to make between conventional and FHA. They're both great programs. They fit different needs, mm -hmm. but it's great to know the ins and outs of them. And it doesn't mean that just because you get an FHA loan that you can't, you know, refinance down the road. Something else later. Um, that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. um, so there's options. Okay. Um, so the, one of the things we've been talking about is the mortgage insurance, but what are some other closing costs and how can you kind of estimate? Because yeah. you're going to have to bring the down payment and closing costs to the table. Correct. So how can they budget for that or know what to expect? Yeah, so a general rule of thumb, um, and it is a little broad, but a general rule of thumb is anywhere between um, 2 to 5% of the purchase price. Of the purchase price. So if you're buying a $100,000 house, you'd expect two to $5,000? Two to 5000 correct. Now, there was, um, I did some research myself to kind of see an average, you know, what, okay. they, what they estimate. And um, 
in accordance with a survey that was recently done, the average was about $3,700. Okay. So um, it truly depends on, you know, obviously the, the purchase price. So that's why, you know, we kind of say 2 to 5% um, because, you know, the title fees and so forth, all of those things are, you know, based on that. But, um, you know, that's a, a general rule of thumb. So other than the mortgage insurance, you pay for the appraisal, um, you pay for the title search. What other things are you paying for? So, so generally speaking, when you apply for a mortgage, most lenders are going to have you pay for the appraisal and the credit report fee up front. Okay. So that's generally going to be somewhere between you know four hundred and fifty to maybe five hundred and twenty-five dollars, somewhere in that range. Um, and so you'll pay that. And typically, Visa or Mastercard, you know, um, it'll you know be out of your pocket up front. Okay, so okay. you pay like 500 when you go under contract mm -hmm. for the house, and that pays for the appraisal and the credit fee. Right. And then as you're going through the process, what else would pop up? When you're going through the process, you're not going to pay anything else until you go to the closing table. Okay. So at the closing table, you know, you're going to have, um, you know, all of the fees that are going to exist, which are considered your closing costs. And that's why they're called, called closing costs, because you're at the closing table. So that's what you're going to be bringing in the form of, um, you know, cashier's check or wiring the money, you know, for it. Um, the things that you're going to pay for above and beyond the appraisal and the credit report, you know, are going to be, um, you know, your tax stamps, um, the title, which, you know, the title piece of it is a, is a big title cost, insurance. title insurance, recording fees. Um, then the, they're going to prorate the taxes and then you have to pay for insurance for the house as well. That is correct. Now, th that's probably one of the biggest things that I don't think people kind of budget for, if you will, because when it comes to the homeowner's insurance, um, we um, collect 12 months of the homeowner's insurance. I think that's most people. I've never yeah. had that not happen. Yes, it is. So, But I think that a lot of buyers are not anticipating all of that cost because with the taxes, they are prorated, you know. But with the insurance, it's going to be a whole year's worth. So those are some of the things that you kind of want to budget for. I definitely recommend shopping around when it comes to homeowners insurance. Definitely getting you know several quotes. I'm sure Laura has several people that she could yeah. refer you to um, that are great. Um, I don't recommend just going with any random Joe, um, especially if you are purchasing in certain areas. Um, Specifically, the area that we're in right now, you know, Avondale and San Marco, um, you know, those are some niche areas where it's good. It's different. To, it's, it is different, and it's good to have someone that really knows the market. Yeah. Okay. What I usually tell people is they need to shop around to about three mortgage providers, and I usually tell them to do a bank, a credit union, and then just a private mortgage person, mm -hmm. and then they could also compare and sure. tell the other mortgage people what they're getting so then they can exactly. talk about it. Is yeah. that something that people often do. Can yeah, really match they other. should do. They should do. You wouldn't um, go have shoulder surgery and go with the very first surgeon yeah. that you met with. You probably, you know, shop around and, you know, when it comes to your surgeon, okay. you know, you want, you want the best surgeon out there. Um, so the same thing applies when you're purchasing a home. When you're purchasing a home, it's typically your biggest financial commitment, your biggest decision your biggest that you make. So why would you go with one finance company, you know, yeah. that's going to lend you the money or you just a friend or, or just a friend or yeah. honestly, sometimes the worst stories that I hear are family members, even, you know, like oh. their cousin, you know, is that having the realtors. Too, yeah. Right? I think it happens in, in both yeah. industries, but definitely get, you know, two to three, um, options okay. that you can look at. And the best way to do that um, is to get a loan estimate. A loan estimate is really kind of a you know one or two page document that every lender um, can and should supply you um, so that you compare the cost associated with what they're offering you. Is that it has what does it have on? Is that the closing costs or what? It's not the close. Um, yes, it has it has the closing cost estimate on it, mm -hmm. um, but it it's on the front end, so it's the loan estimate. It's going to break down all of the fees and 
it should, you know, hopefully mirror, you know, what your closing costs, um, you know, look like at the very end, which is going to be um, your closing disclosure. Um, they should be very similar. So, you know, you shouldn't have a loan estimate that's telling you it's going to be this much and it's double. Yeah. Um, the industry is very regulated, so it actually can't be that way. There are certain fees um, that we can't, you know, be uh, any amount off. On. And then there's certain fees where we have a small tolerance, mm -hmm. and then there are things that you shop for that you know they can be out of any tolerance because you shop for them. Okay. Um, but you should absolutely get a loan estimate, and if you you know if you've had your you know credit run and have that information, you know a lot of lenders can kind of take that information, put in, hey, I have a 680 credit score, I'm purchasing this much, and kind of mirror without pulling their report. Without pulling their report. Okay. Now they're never going to be able to give you a um, pre-approval. Mm -hmm. That way, you absolutely have to have your credit pulled to you know do the pre-approval. They um, could ask around and get an idea of what they could buy. Exactly. Like yeah, for sure. One, one thing I do want to mention um, that Prosperity offers is we have an option to um, lock and shop and you know get out there and look for a home and we also protect the rate for 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, we also so have... So what rate are we talking about? What's protected? The, the mortgage interest rate. It's protected for 90 days and in the market that we're in right now with rates going up, it is a, it's a great option. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that we offer, and there's no additional cost for it, is to truly get pre-qualified up front. Before. So go all the way through? You're basically going to provide, you know, all of your, you know, your income and asset documentation on a, um, what we would consider a TBD, which is to be determined property. Okay. And we would pre-qualify you based on that, you know, purchase price, how much you're putting down, you provide us your documents. And that way you truly know that you are pre-qualified versus pre-approved. There is a difference. Um, you know, if you're... Can you explain a yeah, the difference? Yeah, so... I was going to say, there's a lot of words going on here. Yeah, there are. confused. So, basically, if you're going through, like, a pre-approval, it's a lot of information gathering. And So, pre-approval is first, though. It's not that it's first. A lot of times people just will do a pre-approval, and what that means is that the buyer has given the loan officer their basic information. Like income. Income, assets, employment, and credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. But none of it has been truly verified by an underwriter. So they haven't seen any documents. They haven't They're seen any. Trusting. Yeah. And the loan officer may or may not have seen the documents. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're basically going based on what the uh, underwriting system has said they're approved or not approved. Mm -hmm. And so because of it hasn't been seen by an underwriter to calculate income and determine that they're truly qualified, there could be things that come up on the back end that were not, you know, because the underwriter didn't review it up front. Mm -hmm. And so it does make a, a stronger buyer if you're pre-qualified and you have a commitment letter, and that's what you get when the loan has been through underwriting is a commitment letter. So most people, they get the pre-approval letter to go shopping, yeah. to house shop, but then the pre-qualified is better because there's less, uh, less problems that could pop up because the underwriter already saw it. The, the likelihood that something's going to come up and that you can't buy the house is not. Yeah, is so not it's, it's a better option for okay. sure because, um, like I said, the underwriter has reviewed those income documents. Now, certainly, someone could lose their job or change mm -hmm. jobs, or you know, there are yeah. things that can come up. Um, but it is always better to be pre qualified and have an underwriter review your income and asset documentation. And, and just from a realtor perspective, mm -hmm. um, that also is better for a realtor to say to a potential seller. Yeah. So you could say, oh, my, my buyer is pre-qualified, not pre-approved, so we are, are going to encounter less problems. Mm -hmm. And you probably close it faster. That's, okay. Yes, yeah. no, for sure. I'm glad that you mentioned that because that is one aspect of it because we've already seen all of that documentation. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a faster closing process for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is when we were talking about closing costs and shopping for loan providers, Yeah. Um, sometimes people just go for the cheapest interest rate. Mm -hmm. What... Are there some calculations they can do or something to figure out how much everything costs over the long term? Because I've seen some companies where they have a really low interest rate, but their closing costs are huge. So yeah. you basically pay for it later yeah. or in the beginning. That's an excellent question. Um, a, a lot of times a good way to know whether or not you are paying a lot in closing costs is by APR. Mm -hmm. APR is annual percentage rate. 
And it is something that when you're quoting an interest rate, you should also be quoting the annual percentage rate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that every loan officer may do that, mm -hmm. but you should, and it should it would be you know on your um, loan estimate. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you have a 30 year fix, let's say like we've been talking about, and your interest rate is five percent, but your APR is you know five point seven five, because if it's considerably higher. That, that means that you're paying quite a bit in closing costs generally. And APR, annual percentage rate, is kind of how much it costs per year for everything? It is. is it's, kind of, it's kind of like factoring in the closing costs over the course of the year. Yeah, okay. truly what you're paying for. Now, the rate is what you're making your payment based on, mm -hmm. and that is in 30-year fixed case, your rate is fixed, it's never going to change. Mm -hmm. Um, but your APR is factoring in those costs over the life of that loan. So that's definitely one way. Um, we um, at Prosperity, we have a mobile app. Um, we can certainly send that out to you. Laura has access to it. There's all kinds of calculators on there for conventional FHA, VA, USDA. It's, for them to figure out what the rate is and yes. the closing cost and everything so they can play with it. They can play around with it and plug different, you know, options in there to mm -hmm. kind of formulate um, a payment. And, of course, if you ever needed help with it, you know, I would be able to kind of help yeah. you and, and, you know, get you, you know, in the right direction. And we're going to put her contact information in the comments later. Um, okay, so we kind of touched on this. I just wanted you to add like a little yeah, something sure. about, you were talking about different loan providers and shopping. Yeah. So if someone's talking to three loan providers, other than just the money, like mm -hmm. the, what they have to pay to close yeah. or over the course of the loan, what is something that you should look for that you know um, that they're going to take care of you? Because I've had buyers where they have a great experience with a loan officer before mm -hmm. the loan, but then as soon as they go under contract, they never hear from them again, mm -hmm. and we have horrible issues yeah. trying to close it. I think, I think, honestly, the best way to, above and beyond, you know, the rates and the cost, because all, all of that is going to be pretty competitive, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, but, you know, rate and cost is important, and that's why you should shop around. But more than that is the service that a loan officer provides. And I think the best resource for that is your real estate agent, mm -hmm. because, your agent has worked with that individual on many occasions, hopefully mm -hmm. multiple occasions. And if they haven't, they have colleagues that have worked with that individual. Um, so I always think that that is a great resource um, and why you should um, not necessarily go with your neighbor or your friend or your cousin as the loan officer. Um, you should go with who your real estate agent thinks is a professional that gets back to you in a timely manner, that you've had successful closings with. Um, that you have walked through difficult, you know, challenges with and been able to overcome them, you know, relatively uh, easily. Um, I think that there's no greater resource than than your um, agent. I so, can actually share. I'm in the middle of a closing right now, actually, <laughs> and they didn't ask. They just went with the first person that they talked to, and that bank um, – keeps losing their documents. So we're already almost a week past when we we're supposed to close and they're still trying to find documents that have been sent by the buyer multiple times. Um, we had trouble contacting them. So agents do know like who has a bad reputation, who is not a good communicator. So maybe if you get three and then you decide these three, maybe ask your agent, okay, who of these three do you know has issues? Mm -hmm. Every loan company or um, bank has a yeah. reputation with different agents. Well, and the other thing I can tell you just, you know, um, for myself, um, on Zillow, there is a way that you can go out there and, you know, survey, you know, myself as a, a loan officer. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, multiple surveys out there from past um, clients. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have a five-star rating out there. So, you know, so the surveys are kind of like reviews? Yeah, they're like a review of, um, and one of the main questions that they ask is, you know, did your loan close on time? And that's critical. You know, you, you certainly want your loan to close when it's supposed to close, um, but they can also give feedback on the process as well. Um, but I think that that's critical is, you know, there's different um, sources out there to be able to, you know, rate the experience. Prosperity has one as well. So when you do your loan with me, you'll be able to, you know, do that, you know, after the fact um, and, and, you know, rate the experience. And obviously, 
Um, as a loan officer, there's just nothing more, um, I think, priceless than referrals. So you certainly want to do your very best every single time people because remember. people will remember. Um, so those are just different ways, I think, you know, to find um, the best loan officer possible. There's so many options out there. There's a lot of great, you know, loan officers in this area. I've had the pleasure to work with many of them. Um, but there's also just like real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Um, there, I think there's over 8,000 licensed real estate agents in Northeast it. Florida. Yeah, there's and a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them, but they are not all created equal, and that is definitely the case with loan officers as well. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to close with one last question. Yeah. And this is one I get a lot because um, not everyone can buy a super expensive house. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have some friends that they want to buy a fixer upper to save mm -hmm. money. Yeah. But it's a completely different process. So what can you share a little bit of like what they're going to encounter mm -hmm. um, and can expect from trying to get a mortgage on yeah. a fixer upper? So there's a there's kind of two paths with that really. Mm -hmm. Um the the typical path, you know, if you're going conventional FHA, VA, USDA, any mm -hmm. of those, you know, programs, um, you're gonna have an appraisal done. Now, on the government side, and we're talking FHA, VA, you know, those type of programs, um, you're going to have what's called a WDO inspection, which is a wood destroying organism. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. There's a lot of letters. There's a lot of letters in that. Um, so it's like an added layer, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of inspections going on. And the government's very picky. I think most people would agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. So some some sellers won't take government loans because they're known for being picky. Yeah, because they're they're really going to do their due diligence when it comes to the property, which is good for the buyer. It's good for the buyer for yeah. sure. Um, but with that with that being said, um, you know, if if you're if you're going with those types of financing, um, you've got to be aware of of those you know of those things that are you know going to come into play. Um, on the flip side of that. Um, what was I going to say? So with a fixed driver, so you have the WDO yeah. report and it comes back with, okay, yeah. there's termites or, you know, you got to replace the door or right. the roof is shot. Yes. What, Thank you. what would happen after that? So in those situations, those things have to be cured or fixed mm -hmm. prior to you being able to close. Okay. And so that can be a huge issue. You know, um, anything that is structural as well, I mean, even on a conventional, you know, Fannie or Freddie loan, mm -hmm. you know, if the house needs a new roof, that can roof has to be done before you can close. Can you do, I've heard of a renovation loan. That's what that was okay. my other path. Okay. That's the fork in the road. Okay. So we offer uh, renovation loans. We have conventional and FHA. Um, we actually have our renovation expert um, within Prosperity um, coming to Jacksonville next month. And, so and the expert's just someone who does all renovations? That's all he does, okay. yeah. His name's Scott Mulder, and he'll be coming here next month. So okay. Laura, I'm sure, will be yeah, coming yes. to that event. Yeah and be getting educated on everything yeah. renovation when it comes to prosperity. But it's an awesome program because um, I actually went to his um, event in Raleigh last week with a bunch of agents, and I learned a lot too. But one of the things that I learned was that in that area, and I know Jacksonville is this way, there are a lot more opportunities for homes that a buyer could look at if they were willing to do a renovation loan okay. because it's going to open up a lot more doors to homes that are is in their budget okay. you know they may they, they just have to be willing to do a little bit of the work they no not they don't even have to do the work okay. they the work could would be done by a licensed contractor that's part of the renovation loan mm -hmm. but my point is is that you know they may look at a house and say yeah i'm not buying that house because it needs this 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 and this mm -hmm. But if they were willing to do the renovation loan, that is part of it. They would be able to do all of those things. And what was interesting to me, covered in the loan, like the covered price in the of loan. everything is yes, covered in the exactly. Loan. Yeah. The house just has to appraise, you know, once those things are done okay. to be able to justify the loan. So in that scenario, they're not closing until the renovations are done? No, they're closing. Okay. okay? But they would close like they normally would close, mm -hmm. but then checks are cut like after the fact to complete that work, and then an appraisal it's subject okay. to that appraisal. And so Scott, instead of doing an appraisal in the beginning, the appraisal is at the end. That's correct. Yep. 
So there's a lot of great things about that program that Laura will learn about. Mm -hmm. um, it's as simple as sometimes like appliances. I mean, you can put appliances into it. You know, you can add bedrooms and bathrooms to it. I mean, there, it really covers a lot. So it doesn't have to be like the house is falling down. No. It's just simple like, oh, I just want to update the bathroom. It absolutely can. As long as the value, you know, is there once you, um, you know, do those things to it. So there's a lot of options with it. And I'm excited for the agents here to kind of learn more about it because I do think it will open up more doors for your buyers. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always easier to buy a fixer upper because it doesn't take as much money. Yeah. Like, because it's not improved all the way. So something that may be worth 130 improved mm -hmm. could be 220 and then that's out of someone's budget. Exactly. But you know, on the other side of it, if you're not doing a construction loan, like I said, and you're looking at homes that, you know, are going to need a new roof or they're going to need structural, you know, things, um, that can totally be a deal killer, you yeah. know, unfortunately, um, because the lender is not going to provide the financing yeah. until the house has, you know. Well, the bank wants to make sure they're getting a good asset in case you default. Absolutely. And yes. If it's got a problem, you can't really right. sell that well. But we have a solution in the renovation loan if, you know, you're looking to go that route. We do mm -hmm. have that available. Sweet. Well, that was everything. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Thank like, you. I appreciate it. Yes. You did. You Thanks, answered a guys. lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you have any more questions, feel free to comment. Uh, we'll monitor the comments. And then I'm also going to put Meredith's information in the comments. So if you want to contact her, email her, call her, um, that'd be great. You can do loans all over Florida. All of Florida. Okay. Yep. So it doesn't matter if you're in Jacksonville or not. Yes. Um, thanks for joining. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Bye.